here with Matt Ross, writer and director of Captain Fantastic, a title which uh, sort of sounds like you're going for that sweet, sweet superhero <laughs> money. Uh, well, I don't know if I'm going for the superhero money, but I'm certainly, yes, the title is intentionally named. I mean, it's, uh, or I should say it's intentionally chosen. Uh, yeah, I think the title asks a question, is he or is he not? Right. And if he is, how? And if not, why? And so, yeah, it's, I mean, I think the superhero, uh, it, the superhero idea is part of that. And of course, kids tend to see certain adults in that light, you know, yeah. and he's that sort of light as well. Um, of course, so we're talking about, is he fantastic at child rearing? Yes. Um, yes. So we should talk about that. It doesn't fly through the air. No. <laughs> it's, the film's about a, a slightly less fanatic kind of alley fox type, for those who remember uh, the Mosquito Coast. Yeah. Uh, and uh, he's uh, off the grid with the family. He's uh, very rigorous uh, about their intellectual development and their physical development. Mm -hmm. And we also see his sister's family a little later in the picture. Catherine Hahn and Steve Zahn. Right. And uh, they play a sort of more or less average suburban family, yeah. which is a lot less impressive in a lot of ways. Um, but the film sort of also explores the notion of, well, is there perhaps a balance between these two or some other option, uh, which seems very appealing on one hand. There's also kind of a sadness to that, or a sense of loss involved with the idea of compromise. So can you sort of talk about uh, how you got to this subject matter and your feelings about uh, maybe what is the ideal child rearing situation? Well, I don't know if there is an ideal. I mean, I think every parent is grappling with the fact that there's no guidebook and we're all just trying to figure it out as we go along. Uh, did you ask about the origin of the book? Yes, also. Yeah. yeah, so the origin really was uh, well, I'm a parent, I have, I have a father, I have two kids, and I think at some point. I mean, the truth is, on a daily basis, you're recalibrating, if not an hourly basis, and trying to do the right thing by your children. But at one point, when his, my kids were younger, I was thinking a great deal about, really, what are my core values, and what do I want to pass on to my kids? They're only in the house for so long, and I'm curating their lives, you know? I'm responsible for my wife and I, and what they eat, and what they watch, and what do they watch things, or like, why they, you know, right. you know everything, everything. And I think I was probably discussing a great deal with my wife. That's the charitable way of putting it. I was probably, we were probably fighting sometimes about our different view of the world and, and what we thought was appropriate for our children to do or not do. And I had a lot of questions about what kind of father I wanted to be. And in some cases, in many cases, the character of Ben Cash played by Vigo is aspirational and the father I aspire to be in a lot of. And a lot of my, my own personal feelings about what is right, he, he, you know, he engages in, I think we all should be very conscientious of what we eat and we should, have, we should be of sound body and mind and, and uh, I, I think that, you know, we are so far removed from not only our food source but also the seasons, you know, we're so detached from the natural environment and he's a man who's decided to raise his children and try and be in harmony with nature and I think that's very admirable in a lot of ways. Um, you had another question, that was the second part of that question. Oh, about compromise. Yes. I actually know, I mean, it's hard to talk about without revealing the end of the movie, but I actually don't think I would say this. I don't think, he's, I don't think he compromises his values. I think that he's a man who realizes that he's culpable for certain things that are revealed in the movie. He's responsible, and he also has some blind spots, and he comes to realize those blind spots and tries to correct them. But I don't think he gives up any, I don't think he compromises his values. Uh, that's how I read it. Right. You know, uh, it's open for interpretation. But I don't think he's he's compromised in the sense that he's um, he's made made a course correction. No, I don't think so. I think he has made a course correction, but it's not about compromising his values. Right, right. Uh, and it's hard to talk about without right, revealing right. the ending. Right. Um, yeah. Um, so uh, I'd like to hear about the casting process for the family. Mm -hmm. uh, it seems such a daunting task. On you know, paper, it is. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, How would you go about that? Traditionally, um, we had a great casting director, Jeannie McCarthy, and on paper, you know, the kids have to be well-spoken and fit and play musical instruments and or sing and be able to rock climb and do yoga and hunt and all these things. And, Plus, everyone you know, lies about those things on there. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Well, you can't expect a six-year-old or a seven-year-old or an eight-year-old or a ten-year-old to be able to do those things and they do martial arts and all these things. And 
you know, I, got, I saw a lot of tapes, kids from all over the world, from I think pretty much every English-speaking country in the world, all over the United States and Canada and Great Britain and Australia and New Zealand and even I think some from South Africa. And I had a long callback process. Some of the kids did it via Skype. They couldn't be in, in, in L.A. And some kids came to L.A. and I played theater games with them and I asked them to do the improvisations and I paired them up and some of them sang and played, played guitar, played instruments. And, but ultimately what you're really trying to do is trying to find a child whose spirit matches the spirit of the character rather than require them to deliver some kind of performance because though some of them can do that very well, that's only part of the equation. You know, it's yeah. not, that's not only what I'm after. I'm, I'm also after, uh, I, I want to capture something that they can bring that isn't on the page necessarily. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, you mentioned improvisation, theater games. Um, it's something that comes up again and again in the production notes where people are talking about working with you and the tone that you set. Uh, not being too precious about the script, but wanting to encourage that. Can you talk a little bit about the role of improvisation and maybe uh, any particular discoveries you recall? Well, really the goal of it is to free them so that they're behaving on camera and not acting, and that you're really talking and listening, and I would encourage them, I mean, I spent a long time writing the script, and I thought I honed it pretty well, and I thought it was worth filming, so we start there, right. and then, and so I'm not saying don't say the lines, you know, I, I want to say these lines, and some of them are very specific, you know, many, if not all of them are very specific, um, and you can't expect the children to improvise in the tone or the language uh, that the kids can, uh, as scripted, you know what I mean, like it's, it's complex, the thoughts are complex, especially, you know, when they're eight, um, even for an adult, frankly, it's, it was complex. So, having said that, you know, one of the ways you do that is you don't turn off the camera, and you're hoping to capture behavior. I mean, what, one of the things that kids can do that is harder for adults is to forget they're being filmed. You know, the children sometimes, you know, Charlie Shotwell, who plays nine, there's a shot in the movie where he's picking his nose, and he didn't pick he's his nose. Like six, right? He six, was, seven. I think he turned seven, six to into seven when he shot the movie. He wasn't picking his nose because he thought it was a great acting choice. Like, I'm a child, I should pick my nose. Yeah. It's just that he forgot the camera was on, so he was behaving as he would, his nose itched, and he picked it. Yeah. And we capture it. And so, some way, the improvisation, in some ways, the improvisation is toward that. And Shri Crooks is very facile as an actor, and she would improvise a lot. And, 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 and it's really about talking and listening and being present. And, and so, that's the goal of it. And to bring, to allow them to push and pull. The text a little bit. Mm -hmm. The goal is really to for them to feel that there's not a rote or set way that they must behave in every take, but that they can. You know, sometimes people would have to say, "Okay, guys, wait, slow down, slow down." It's my line. You know what I mean? Right. And, and and he was right to say that because they wouldn't shut up. But I encourage them to do that sometimes, and, and you know, he and or he'd have to push through and say, "Okay, guys, shh, Daddy has something to say." Right. You know? and that's good. They're engaged. They're they're in it. You know? yeah. Um, can you also talk a little bit about the uh, preparation that you did with them once they were cast, the boot camp, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, the one-on-one -on -one rehearsals that you could do? Yeah, so I, well, the one-on-one -on -one rehearsals were really not theater rehearsals where we put it on the stage and ask them to do blocking, or you know, it, wasn't, it wasn't that. It, it, I spent time with every actor, all of those on the poster, everyone on the poster, and, and others as well. Um, but certainly with the family legal, and we went through all of their scenes before just to make sure I could answer any questions or anything that came up. Vigo and I've been doing a lot of that for the whole script, but for certainly the kids, I walked through all their scenes and every scene that the family is in and talked to each kid individually. And then with the boot camp was we brought everyone, including Vigo, weeks in advance, and there were a lot of skills that they sh they needed to be acquainted with. You know, um, I didn't expect them to master them. That's the fool's errand. It's an impossibility. When George Rakai was cast, he was in London and he started doing yoga. He said, I love to do he did yoga three or four hours a day. Everyone was doing musical rehearsals because there's two musical numbers in the film. They were all doing rock climbing and rock climbing gym because there's rock climbing in the film. Vigo was doing bagpipes. The two teenage girls, Sammy Slur and Emily Spasso, butchered the sheep because they dressed like hair in the movie. They were also doing Esperanto. I, I've done some MMA and Brazilian Jiu Jitsu in my life, so I brought one of my coaches from LA and he did some grappling and some judo with him because there's judo in the film. They were all doing all this every day, and really it's not, you know, 
It's like you can't learn a foreign, obviously you can't learn a foreign language in two weeks, but if you had to speak German in a film, working with a German coach and you memorize the lines, one could teach you the tone, the intonation enough to, that a German speaker might see that and think, oh, he speaks German. So you're just memorizing that bit and doing it very well. It's sort of like that. It's really to act, sort of to acclimate them to these things, but ultimately what it is, it, it's about providing opportunity for them to bond as a family and amongst each other, the kids, but also look at Ego as their friend and kind of a father figure and hopefully they fall in love and trust him. Yeah. They call him Summer Dad, which was pretty cool. <laughs> um, so, um, you know, the, the whole notion of um, living off the grid, uh, uh, this is not the same thing, of course, but it occurred to me there's somewhat of an analogy for you as someone who's working in uh, the film industry you live in Berkeley, which is yeah. not the hub of the film industry. Sure, sure. Um, is that uh, is it deliberate uh, as a choice, or was it more of just sort of something that happened? Just it's something choice. that happened. My wife is from Berkeley, and, and and she's not in the film business, and really, her community was in Berkeley or New York, where we lived for a while, and she just didn't want to live in a town that she really didn't know anyone. It was hard to start over, and so it was that. And also, I think on some level, some emotional level, it's healthy for me to not be constantly aware of where I'm in the food chain of business, you know, it can be demoralizing and it just helps me to kind of be a little bit removed from it. I mean, I'm, the truth is I'm in Los Angeles every week. Yeah. And I mean that literally, I'm in LA every week. Right. But I don't, I don't, it's, you know, I mean, I suppose there could be an argument that it's necessary that you should, one should live there in order to network and whatever, but I don't really do that. So, I mean, I just, it's healthy for me to remove myself and whether it's Berkeley or, you know, I know people live in Ojai or Santa Barbara or just or wherever they live outside of LA, right? Some as far away as New York City. Um, uh, it's hard, it's challenging, but it's, um, I think ultimately it's good for my mental health a little bit. So, uh, I'm uh, also interested in, um, you talked about uh, the work that you did with Vigo a bit. Um, uh, he's sort of an extraordinary collaborator and actor, it seems. Um, in um, uh, one of the things you talk about uh, in the press notes is his striving for accuracy, like vetting the script. He seems to vet the script. Can you talk a bit about that? So the first once once he said he was going to do the role, he sent me a, a, an email that I printed out. I think it was twelve or thirteen pages, and it was all notes, and they were really not. Oh, I don't like that, or that's not. I don't want to do that. It wasn't about the narrative. It was: Is this factual? Would it happen like this? Is this correct? He had a lot of fact checking, and and I appreciate that because I always said the movie takes place in the real world. This is not an alternative universe or a fantasy or a hyper reality. This is the real world. It's an extreme version of conscious parenting, but I can give you actual examples that are even more radical. The truth is, the truth is stranger than fiction. Um, and so I said it happens in the real world, and so the conversation was very much about that. Sometimes he had some ideas about. Well, you wrote that this happens in this location. What if it happened in that location? Or what would that be like? And really, it wasn't about him saying what you wrote is wrong or bad or I don't like that. It was much more about he wanted to have a discussion with me about the, some bits of the narrative. And I wanted that. I want, you know, sometimes I said to him, well, that's a good idea. We can do that. And we did. Or sometimes I said, no, I think logistically that's going to be impossible because of the schedule. Or, no, I said it there for these reasons. And it forced me to articulate some of my own thoughts. And he'd be like, okay, that makes sense. And, you know, uh, it's more of a filmmaking is collaborative. And he is, as the lead actor, one of my central collaborators, along with the DP and the production designer, the costume designer, and, you know, my producer. And, um, so I, I, I care deeply about what he says. And, and He's a very intelligent, thoughtful man, and I was very happy to have him aboard. And so I, um, I, 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 I welcomed, actively welcomed his thoughts. Yeah. Um, of course, you also are an actor, uh, 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 and you have a very uh, high-profile role at the moment on <laughs> Silicon Valley. <laughs> That's a great show. As a high pro, I agree. As a high-profile character to uh, this uh, CEO of Hulu, Gavin Belson. Yeah. Um, now, that character has to be just extraordinarily vivid on the page. Uh, I can imagine that it might not take very much research to play that role, and you can just play it right off the page. But did you do any research before studying? A little bit. I mean, Mike, when I talked to Mike when we cast him, Mike Judge, he didn't say, so you're a combination of this guy and this guy. 
but I kind of realized over talking to him or listening to him talk, he would reference certain people that I think he pulled from a little bit, like a haircut or the way that guy dressed or that. But I didn't, I didn't watch YouTube videos of particular CEOs and rip off what they did. I'm not doing anyone. It's yeah. it's a fictional character who's in some way a, a you know a, a combination of many different guys. So I did read a couple. Uh, biographies or autobiographies of certain individuals, Steve Jobs and some others, uh, who I could mention, but it was, that was more about introducing myself to the culture, you know, the tech culture, and much less about wanting well, to rip off the way that guy stood or that guy sounded. Uh, and I'm, I'm not doing that. I'm not, it's not based on anyone. Right. Yeah. And uh, what kind of feedback have you gotten since uh, well, you spent a lot of time around here? People say that it's, it seems to be very accurate, if not accurate, that, that they say that, again, truth is stranger than fiction, the big examples that they would say from their own life, a boss they worked with or for, or someone they knew, who was even more extreme. So I think, but again, the credit goes towards Mike Judge and Alan Berg, who are the showrunners, and um, uh, Clay Tarver and Dan O'Keefe are also the, the brain trust of the, of the show. It really goes to them and all the technical advisors and I mean, in this case, I am just the actor who says the lines and acts out that one role, and the credit goes to them for accurately portraying that world. Uh, it seems like a show that could go on uh, indefinitely in terms of its popularity, but uh, do you think it has a, a, a life? I don't know. I mean, I think that if you look at the pattern of HBO, there's certain shows that are hits that are given a six-year, or, a, you know, Sopranos, Girls, Entourage, there's, just, there's a bunch of shows that... that were part of the zeitgeist or were critically successful and uh, or had uh, you know some kind of some sort of success with audiences and allowed them to have a, a longer life than five years. I think that's really up to HBO and, and Mike, you know, and Alec how long they want to do the show. I, I don't know. I'm, I, I'm not privy to that stuff. But you'd be content to do it as long as... As long as they invite me to that party, I'm going to go to that party. I'm very happy to be invited to that party. So going back to Captain Fantastic, um, was there a particular day on the set that uh, you, you felt uh, especially triumphant at achieving something, getting something in camera? Not so much triumphant, but you know, people, we shot the film not entirely in chronological order, not in literal chronological order, but we shot the compound, the, the homestead stuff first, then the suburban stuff second, and then the, the, the Franklin Jolla and Dowd stuff at the house in New Mexico third. So it was in, in kind of in the order of the movie. And though not, you know, not, not seen by scene, literally. I know that some directors shoot things chronologically that we did not do that, we couldn't, but, um, so, uh, early on, there's a scene where, and I don't think it's revealing really anything because it shows in the trailer where the mother is dead and, um, Vigo's character tells the children, and that was very early on, and, you know, people were, were curious to see if that would work or how that would work, and I think when, when I saw how open and vulnerable and, uh, amazing those children were, how emotionally accessible they were, I thought this this may work, this may work. But there was a there was a long road ahead of us, so I, you know you don't ever relax. Um, really, you know, every day is a new challenge. But I certainly felt, oh okay, this is good. This is this, this, some of this is working. You know, and, and, yeah. All right, well it's been great talking with you. Best of luck with the film. Thank you so much.